Sarah, hello. It's a pleasure to meet you hello. even at an electronic distance. It's um, such an where, honor and pleasure to meet you. You're very kind. Where are you in real life, as the young people say? I am in Brooklyn in real life. Where are you in real life? I'm in Clerkenwell in London. Um, three streets that way is where um, Fagin's Den was. So I'm in uh, the... The footprint of where I live in London is belongs to Dickens, Amazing. but um, 15 minutes walk that way. If I'm with my dog and he's a hurry is Brunswick Square, Tavistock Square. So mm -hmm. when I was adapting um, Orlando for the stage, if I needed to go and hash something out with Virginia, Mm -hmm. I could either be in the British Library, which felt like uh, a space connected to her, or I would just go and stare at her statue in um, the square over in Bloomsbury and wait for her e stony expression to give me a clue as to where to go to. <laughs> Amazing. When I was last in London, I was looking for her apartment and it seemed to be a falafel shop. <laughs> And I don't know if I was looking in the wrong place, but um, but it, but it, I'm glad that she appeared to you with her stony expression. Did she did she give you inspiration when when you most needed it? Yes, um, I think that's the word that, having worked on the book, that most easily comes to hand in regard to her is inspiring, mm -hmm. in the literal sense of she not only gives you enthusiasm mm -hmm. she makes you believe it's worth going on she gives you really good ideas to work on mm -hmm. uh, she left an extraordinarily practical legacy for mm -hmm. someone whose popular image is sometimes of someone who you know who w worked in a fog which combined eccentricity and wealth and mental illness in equal measure it seems to me she's had such a hard-headed artist in the best possible way that mm. she she offers good advice that's interesting thinking about wolf's practicality i don't think anyone's ever used those two words together that i've heard before but i was i was at the exhibit about wolf at the new york public library and they had a bunch of her stuff from hogarth press um including some of some of the um the the printing that she did herself laid out with the typeset and I had no idea yeah. that she was typesetting Catherine Mansfield herself because she liked the feel of it she liked the practicality and the um and the materiality of it and sort of calm things down a little bit and I always I also think of her as practical in the sense of um She's a very moral writer. She wants to be a better person and she makes wants to make you a better person, I think, mm -hmm. in, a, in a simple and admirable way. Nothing, I don't mean she moralizes, mm -hmm. but I think there's, I certainly found the response of the audience to Orlando as a story when it, my version finally got on stage. And I wonder if this was the same. Everybody felt it was, she was talking to them mm, mm -hmm. no none of the audience members that i got feedback from were like oh isn't she wonderful off there in the glorious haze of the past mm -hmm. but she seems to be talking to us in quite an urgent present tense mm -hmm. Did, is that well, something that rings true for you Absolutely. And I think part of it is she's so enormously prescient and ahead of her time in terms of how she talks about gender and sexuality. I mean, the yeah. um, the kind of fluidity that she understood and, and embodied in Orlando, I think, feels totally present day. And it's interesting for me because I originally was asked to adapt Orlando 20 years ago when I was just starting out being a playwright. It might even be 25 years ago now. Um, and at that time, the conversations about gender in the States were quite different to what they are now. Yeah. And so for me, every production I've seen of my adaptation has taken place at a different cultural moment 
in terms of where we were talking about gender. So that so that's really interesting to me. And I think this moment in time now feels like an incredible foothold um, for, for Wolf's uh, really philosoph philosophy of gender. I mean, I think Orlando yeah. isn't just that. It's playful, it's exuberant, it's a love letter. I think it's in a way the most theatrical of her novels, mm -hmm. um, whether she intended that or not. Um, but I really do think it speaks to the younger generation coming up now. Absolutely. I had a fascinating conversation in the corner of the rehearsal room with one of the younger members of our company on the first day who said to me, so where did you get the idea for this framing device that this written book was written in the 1920s? <laughs> and I went, no, no, it was it was written in the 1920s. She did die in 1941. Mm -hmm. um, and they went, right. Like, really? Really? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's partly because we've gone through, in terms of the history of our own thinking about not just homosexuality and bisexuality and heterosexuality, but fluidity, yeah. the idea of a spectrum and that ident identity can evolve through a lifetime mm -hmm. um, was actually much more current in the 1920s than mm. it was in the 1950s or mm -hmm. again in most sections of the society in the 1980s we went through a real trough of social conservatism yeah. sexual conservatism yeah. between then and now i think yeah there's a, there's a great joy in bringing a younger generation the wisdom of their great ancestor Mm -hmm. um and saying yep yeah, mm -hmm. she's right there with you kids um watch and learn uh, mm -hmm. and learn learn from her fearlessness mm -hmm. something that was talked about a lot in our audience was what a pleasure it was to see gender played with mm -hmm. joyfully mm -hmm. and respectfully yes because I'm sure it's the same in the States. Our, our right wing media and our right wing government is so keen to make every discussion of sexuality rancorous and divisive mm -hmm. and uh, in order to align it with some of their maneuvers to, to stay in power. And we we can easily buy into that. I think all of us in our moments of weakness buy into that that this is a time where sexuality is a real problem and it's divisive and uh, all sorts of terrible things are being done and said instead of recognizing that perhaps as the 1920s were for wolf and her contemporaries this is a moment of possibility and can be a moment of generosity it's the playfulness yes that i you know, any if she'd written nothing else except the mm -hmm. sentence, he was a woman, she would earn her place, I think, in the Hall of Fame. It's mm. it's so joyful. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter how many times I read the book, every time I come to that sentence, I think, how did you do that? It's one of the most perfect sentences in the English language. No. I think. It's also beautifully said, and I couldn't agree more. And I think in this country, it's really, really bad right now, the way... Yeah. Um, right is is using the trans um, community as a kind of punching bag it's really really bad um, yeah. and I think I remember I had a student I teach at um, the Yale School of Drama um, and a, a trans writer was wanting to explore stories of transition and and joy you know how could yeah. how could there be a story about a joyful transition instead of um, a narrative that was about um, pain. Um, and, and so, you know, I said, read Orlando and, and write, you know, write, write a story that contains a sudden transformation um, and, and joy, which this incredible player MJ Kaufman did and, and um, now has written the, the book for this musical, Transparent in LA. Right. Um, 
But anyway, yeah, stories about joy and liberation and, and playfulness and gender are feeling in short supply sometimes yeah. um, culturally. Although I, I I've seen more, I've seen more and more this year on Broadway, which is really exciting. Um, but she went for the buoyancy. And I think, I think she, apparently she wrote it the fastest of any book she ever wrote. And I think it was partly because yes. she was in love, <laughs> which yep. always helps. So there's a love and a buoyancy. And, um, you know, the fact that she wrote it for a person, I think is really yep. interesting that she wrote it for Vita. I'm always interested in plays as gifts and novels as gifts and the idea of this particular um, dedication of one reader be becoming um, a bigger, more universal audience. I think that's partly the intimacy with which the audience comes and says, oh, she's speaking to me because the the book has such a specific sense of address. I think you're absolutely right. I think that sense that it's a speaking book. Um, mm -hmm. I, In some ways, it seems to me a very um, teenage book in that it reminds me in that moment of your life where you can't sleep and you're you're either writing desperately in my case a letter to some boy that I'm never going to dare to send anyway or I'm writing in my diary oh god when will it end will he ever kiss me will I ever be free it has that sort of midnight oil <laughs> um giddiness to it mm -hmm. and and also it makes it very randy i think it's a marvelously mm -hmm. sexual book although mm -hmm. it has no explicit sex acts in it it's fused with that possibility mm -hmm. you can tell it's being written by someone who's either just been kissed or is looking forward to the next mm -hmm. time and mm -hmm. i think that all gives it a marvelous it wasn't hard to find a tone of voice for the piece. Mm -hmm. In fact, I don't remember looking for a tone of voice because it has a tone mm -hmm. of voice. And so one's job is simply to uh, get that get that down, get that across using her words as much as possible was what I found. I love that idea of it being written in between the time between being kissed and wanting to be kissed the the sexiness of it and um it's interesting the the film um that that was so brilliant does not have um the buoyancy actually of the novel it's interesting it's much more melancholy yes than, than the novel is and so i remember when i was working on it i specifically wanted the joy i thought there's there's plenty of melancholy to go around and in Wolf's other books, and she touches, she touched, she yeah. never doesn't touch the melancholy, particularly in the 20th century when Orlando sits down and says, Yeah, who then am I? But yeah. in a way, it's saved for the 20th century. Um, I think that's an interesting reflection of the time and place and context in which Potter made her film. Uh -huh. It has an it, the melancholy is of a specifically interior kind, I yeah. think. And yeah. it comes from an era where our backs were against against the wall in this country. If you were queer, if you uh -huh. were a feminist, if you were an artist, if you were a distant, you had to turn inwards uh -huh. to find your, your magic, your inspiration inside yourself. And so I... It's a very specific refraction of the book, but I remember at the time, I, I, I can't remember how I, I went, I went to the premiere in London. I can't think who I was shagging, who invited me, but I must have known somebody connected with it. And it seemed incredibly of the moment. And I made a very conscious decision all the way through the time that I was working on my adaptation that I wouldn't watch Sally's mm -hmm. film because so many of the images and I I I have, I was I had the great good fortune to have met some of the people who are in the film. I'd I'd met Timmy, I'd met Gilda D mm -hmm. uh, Jimmy Somerville, I'd met Tilda, I'd met Quentin Chris once. So they were they were all real people to me. So I needed them absolutely out of my head before yeah. I could put 
pen to paper. Did but, you know that you would be writing for Emma? Yes and no. First of all, I did a first draft of the piece before Emma came onto my horizon. And there was a possibility of that being done in another theatre under very completely different circumstances, a totally different kind of theatre, an open air theatre, in fact. Um, and that came to nothing. And it had got to first draft and I put it in a drawer. And then unbeknownst to me, um, my agent showed it to Michael Grandage, who eventually directed it, because Michael had just worked with Emma Corrin on a film. Mm -hmm. And so the first I knew about it was Michael phoned me up and said, um, I've got this script. What would you think about um, writing, finishing writing this with Emma Corrin playing Orlando? And I thought about that proposition for 0.1 seconds. <laughs> That's and so said, brilliant. Yes. And so now, brilliant. of course, it it's for me, it's it's hers. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and we should be so lucky mm -hmm. to have, I should say, it is theirs. Mm -hmm. um, forgive me, Emma. I always screw up, as you know. I can visualise Emma grinning at me across the room <laughs> saying, stay calm and try again, darling. Um, <laughs> we should be so lucky to have them amongst us and to have seized the opportunity of that role with both hands and mm -hmm. make and it's something extraordinary of it. Mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. What, Sarah, could I ask you, what yeah. started you? When did you first go, oh, I think I could put Orlando on the stage? What was the trigger for you? So it, it was the most boring trigger, which is someone asked me to. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> You know, my mentor um, in Chicago, who's a director, said, I, I'm in love with this book. I think you'd be great for it. Would you do it? And in a way, I was too young to be um, um, frightened of, of the scope of it or frightened of Wolf's genius. I was just, oh, yeah. Um, and then mm -hmm. I went away and did it very quickly. And um, it, it's a, it was a theater in Chicago that's very interested in ensemble work and and sort of literary work that um, that is adapted. So it made sense. Um, and then it went through various incarnations. I mean, what, what I was saying about the, um, the moment in which my adaptation was done reflected the cultural moments in such weird, interesting ways. So the director chose to cast a man in the first act, a male actor, and then a female actor in the second act. And I said, no, 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 that's not the way. And, and she said, well, I have, you know, this many people in the ensemble and that's how I want to do it. And I said, oh God, well, then there's no queer possibility. Like it's not, ugh, it's not transformational. And she did it. And I was young and she was old and there was a power dynamic anyway. Um, and then the review blamed me for the choice. And I thought, oh, God. And she called me and said, oh, you took the hit for me. Um, and then she did it in L.A. with uh, a woman playing it all the way through. Um, and, and so that that was in a way progress. And, and then, you know, it, it, it's it's now that it becomes more possible to do the play with a whole with a with a trans cast or with a gender fluid identifying cast. So every every time I've seen it, um, there's been a new way of framing it, which is so interesting to me. Yeah, it's great that it. Of course, it the story is about evolution. I mean, yeah. we have it's a journey through time, and extraordinarily, it ends in the present moment so the present moment in which right. it ends is always going to be the present moment in which the curtain comes down at the end of that yeah. particular note I think it's a gift I'm fascinated that you said you wrote it quickly um I wrote mine quickly too but everybody says to me every interview that I did they say oh god it must have been so hard how do you start to adapt Orlando and I kind of went well you just put all the really great things in the book in consecutive order and, and try <laughs> yes. and employ some good <laughs> actors. Why Why does it, is that, it, do you share that same sense of it was as, 
as adaptation jobs go, and like you, I've done plenty, it was swift. The ideas came quickly. Likewise, and I think um, maybe it's something about the buoyancy of how Wolf wrote it. I put my favorite bits in. Yeah. <laughs> I tried to create a skeleton. <clears throat> Um, I tried to take out the bits that seem more literary or meant for the page. And mm -hmm. whenever there was a theatrical moment, I, I put that in. You know, it was kind of intuitive, yeah. actually. I didn't I, um, torment and myself. And I think it it has such a great structure. Mm -hmm. People talk about Wolves as this sort of shimmering prose impressionist. Mm -hmm. And yet, Orlando, it's cracking. So there's this boy... And mm -hmm. he's being seduced by Elizabeth I. Okay, you have my immediate attention. <laughs> and then he lives until the 18th century. Okay, that's good. And mm -hmm. then he turns into a woman. Wow, that's fantastic. And then she lives and she's still alive right now. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. As as a pitch, it it falls off the page. And that's that's what I one of the things I so deeply admire about it it's got that brilliantly original but absolutely cast iron logical structure it uh -huh. has the logic of great surrealist art mm -hmm. it's perfectly real it's just that she lives 400 years and oh by the way she was born a man and no she's not transgender not yeah. at all she mm -hmm. just is one thing and then she falls asleep and she wakes and up another. as another thing yeah Gosh. it's brilliant it's it's mythological it's real it's a fairy tale it's not you know it's um it's ex it's more external than than many of her books yeah. the interior sort of begins in the 20th century and i think what you said earlier about troughs of time the idea that you know, in the 20s, they were much more progressive about gender than they were in the 50s and 80s. And then there was a kind of recollection and moving forward. And I yeah. feel like Wolf talks about that in centuries, you know, the idea that the Elizabethans were quite liberated in certain ways, sexually and in terms of gender. And then in the 19th century, they started covering up, yeah. you know, the legs of tables. Um so again, like all, all the stuff, I feel like we we learned in the academy about gender theory and queer theory and social construction of sexuality and gender. It's it's all it's all there. I mean, it's all there in terms of what she says time does to us and how we're situated. And and yet, I find it beautiful too, in a spiritual sense, I guess, the idea that there's still this little seed of the person, you know, who who can go through the centuries and whose identity remains somewhat intact, regardless of what clothes they're wearing, um, mm. who's on the throne, um, what adventures they're having. That sense of an indestructibility mm. became very important to me. One thing I hadn't realized, I wrote it, but it wasn't until I saw it in front of the audience. I, I had a moment towards the end where Orlando as um, she then is, is moving out of the 1920s towards the future, towards the present day, mm -hmm. says to Virginia Woolf herself, because Woolf was on stage all night through in my version, um, says, but who am I now? Yeah. Yeah. And Woolf said, darling, I, I can't tell you. I, mm -hmm. I died in 1941. I can't tell you who you are in 2023. Mm -hmm. And we hadn't realized until we put it in front of the audience how moving that was and how quietly devastating it was. A very real sense that this fragile woman threw her own body into the fight into wow. the earning of a future for the rest of us and that this apparently joyous evanescent brilliant whimsical book has this steely core of she gave herself in the wow. great experiment mm -hmm. of becoming who she was and uh, 
pave the way for the future in an incredibly, as I say, material sense. One felt mm. the audience almost wanting to shout thank you mm. at that point. It was incredibly touching and rather shocking uh, to bring her death into the room that uh, she did pay a price. She did. She did. Um, and one wonders if she lived now and had the correct SSRI. Yeah. You know, would 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 she have a you know an 80, 80 year long career instead of a shorter one? But no, that's beautiful what you said about her embodying a gift and then and leaving it to us. Yeah. I guess I also think of the the book too as as kind of the scope of it's it's many epics, but it's almost like one lifetime too. It's almost like Orlando starts yes. with this boy and then and and then it goes up until middle age. And I can't tell you how many times I the, the line goes through my line through my head from the novel about oh this must be middle age. We don't know you know why we go up the stairs and why we go down again. I just I was looking for bath salts and yeah. I. Heard you know, I, I got a whiff of perfume from, you know, Sasha. I, it all feels like that now to me. And it's it's funny that I, I wrote the adaptation 20 years ago when I wasn't middle-aged, you know, when I felt more a sense of robust adventure. <laughs> you yeah. know, Orlando starts out. I, I, I do think in that sense, there's there's so many entry points for people. Yeah. In the story. Yes. We we had an audience that was uncharacteristically diverse in terms of age range for the West End. So there was silver hair next to cropped hair almost mm -hmm. every night. And uh, right. yeah, I loved I loved that. One of the other simplest things in retrospect that I loved about it was the chance to write for an almost entirely uh, for a female heavy company so we ended up having one man in the company and sort of two and a bit non-binary people and everyone all the other performers were women of various presentations and that's an obvious thing but that was a great part of the pleasure for me of going oh look the mm -hmm. theater's full of women Mm. And it's it's a it's a female voice retelling English history, and look yeah. how much more interesting it is, and how much more perhaps hopeful it is. So mm. that that I again that I hadn't realised until I saw it in the flesh in front of me. Mm. Um, that I loved. That I, loved. I wish I could have seen your production. It sounds extraordinary. Is there any talk of bringing it back or? I will just say pregnantly that I'm not allowed to talk about it. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> good, good. Yeah, it would be great. Yeah. Um, so aren't we lucky? What a job. It is. I do think that's one of the pleasures of adaptation, too, is getting to sort of kneel at the feet of a master, you know. Um, I mean, I've yeah. gotten to to work on some Chekhov and some Wolf, and you just think, oh, if I can just retype their sentences, surely that will help me. <laughs> yeah, I, I was working on Orlando and an adaptation of Jekyll and Hyde at mm -hmm. the same time. And it, again, two writers who never wrote a boring sentence right 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 you just and, and had you been a wolf person before this came well, about i was a wolf person in a very odd and particular way i wasn't i wasn't a wolf as we ended up calling ourselves when we were, the company decided they would be called the virginia wolves <laughs> um, I wasn't a wolf in that I not I had not read deeply and widely in Wolf. Um, I knew A Room of One's Own, which is also a great, great, great favourite of mine. Yeah. I think that's yeah. a magisterial book. I love it. 
But uh, to be honest, I was I was really slow coming to the major novels. But the way I was close to her was as a person, because for 30 years, my husband and I lived in two different places on the Suffolk coast. Mm -hmm. And we often used to walk our dog along the river at Rodmel. Mm -hmm. um, so parking the car just down the road from monk's mm -hmm. house was yeah. summer residence and taking the walk to the river which was her last ever walk and then walking up to southeast bridge and then our flat in london was in bloomsbury and also i'm good friends with someone who knew duncan grant when he was still living at charleston so i often visited charleston and kind of got shown the back door and the private stories of that building so wolf was kind of my neighbor i met her as a real person who'd lived and died this is her house that's where she wrote her books um this is where she decided she couldn't face another breakdown and left that last incredible letter to her husband one of the most beautiful letters ever written I think mm -hmm. so she was very material for me and when I that was actually the decision to maybe I should work on Orlando was I had a busy day when I was in Sussex and London on the same day and I walked by the river at Southies and then I was walking by the river at Blackfriars and somehow those two rivers connected and in some way that I can't logically explain because neither certainly the river at Rodmel doesn't appear in my stage adaptation although the Thames does something mm -hmm. about the material continuity of time mm -hmm. across those two spaces that her Elizabethan Thames is still running Mm -hmm. backwards and forwards on the tide in London and mm -hmm. and the river at Rodmel is also tidal so in my head they became the same river the real river of her life and death and the kind of fictional river of Elizabethan London which you get so powerfully in all the way through the Elizabethan sequence of the book mm -hmm. I think that's where it came but now I'd be lying if I said oh yes I'm, I'm I read every word she's ever written no no well, I haven't I have read every word but that's beautiful that you met her as sort of a real person a person with with geography yeah materiality uh, I mean I, I was very I lucky though I do have a best friend who lives just up the road road who is the wolf nut of all time I mean he's not only got the letters he's read them and so yeah. if I had to phone him up and say where does she say that thing about and he would go hang on yeah I've got it here it's on page 47 yeah. so that was really useful I had my own kind of private wolf database who I could call so thank you Stephen Pelton if you're listening <laughs> to this he was fantastic Sarah I've just seen the time yeah and I know me too we're we're good I think right uh, we're not only good I've promised that I'm going to pick the dog up in nine minutes so if that's okay with the Royal Society of Literature I should get my skates on I just wanted to say before we go Sarah what an absolute pleasure to meet you and to share your evident pas passion and deep knowledge of Virginia and her works it's been a wonderful conversation thank oh, you likewise and if you're ever in Brooklyn please stop by and we'll walk our dogs together and we can think about how Wolf loved her dog and and thought that they were playful playful beacons that writers should you know ha have an attachment to to playful joyful creatures so I think you walking your dog is the perfect perfect way to end